CRISPR, revolutionary <laughs> technology that can edit genetic mistakes, is getting attention and scrutiny this morning. It's been called the scientific breakthrough of the year. The CRISPR technology is like software for the genome. We can program it easily using these little bits of RNA. A few years ago, with my colleague Emmanuel Charpentier, I invented a new technology for editing genomes. It's called CRISPR-Cas9. The CRISPR technology allows scientists to make changes to the DNA in cells that could allow us to cure genetic disease. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to meet you. Thank you. You know, in looking at my homework for this, I'm just sort of stunned by how much there is to talk about. But let's start with something basic. What is it that you do? I think I'm for foremost in, uh, a biochemist. You know, I'm somebody who likes to understand life at the level of molecules. When did you get interested in biology? I, you know, I grew up in a remote uh, kind of part of the country. I was in a small town in Hawaii, and I have always been fascinated by nature. I think I, I loved the fact that there were so many interesting organisms that had, you know, arisen on this island environment. And uh, I think for me, it really, you know, it came down to thinking about also about the chemistry of those organisms. I got very early on. I had a wonderful uh, chemistry teacher in high school who taught us as kids that. Science is a, you know, it's a, it's about solving puzzles, and I found that really captivating. When did you say to yourself, "I'm dream of being a world-class research biologist"? Well, I, you know, I went to college um, with an interest in chemistry and biochemistry in particular, and um, you know, I struggled. I mean, I my freshman year, I was taking general chemistry and and absolutely struggling in that class, struggling in a, a couple of ways, struggling to do well on exams, but frankly also really struggling with the material, struggling to understand, do, why do I care about this? Do I care about this? So I, you know, I, I got through that year, and then I remember in the fall of my sophomore year, I was studying French language and loved it and had a wonderful uh, French professor, and I went to her office at one point and I said, you know, I'm thinking about switching my major to French. And she, and she said, well, what's your current major? And I said, chemistry, and she said, oh, don't change. <laughs> Stick with chemistry. <laughs> I never forgot that. You know, it was really one of those kind of All right, precious so moments. When, moment. This yeah. is at or near the end of your freshman year. Yeah, yeah. When I was having real doubts about, you know, can I really do this and should I do it? And you know, I've wanted to do it for so long and now I'm not sure. And she said, No, no, you stick with it. This is a wonderful thing for you to be pursuing. And you could study French on the side, but you should, if you're interested in chemistry, you should do it. I think that was great. And so I did. And then I, I would say another kind of, for me, landmark moment was um, in my junior year, I was taking a biochemistry class at that point. And in the spring of that year, my professor said, um, you know, I have two openings in my research lab this summer for students that would like to do research. And shockingly to me, I was selected. And so I, I went to the laboratory, and when I got to the lab, my professor said, um, uh, you know, I, I've been trying to, to get these bacteria to grow on big, um, on, on these big sort of auger plates, and we haven't been able to get it to work. And so, you know, I'm going to give you a chance to try it, but it probably won't work. And I thought, oh gosh, you know, giving a new student who doesn't know anything something that we already know maybe doesn't work uh, <laughs> sounds risky. But I, you know, I sat down, I did some reading, and I figured out, I sort of wrote down a protocol for how to do that, try to do this. And I did the experiment, and lo and behold, I came in the next day, and I peeled back the foil on this big sort of baking pan, growing these bacteria, and I had this beautiful circular kind of culture of bacteria. It was beautiful. And I was just stunned, I was stunned, you know, and my, and my professor was too. <laughs> I think she was just as shocked as I was that it worked. And it just, it was this incredible boost of self-confidence. You know, it's like, okay, I guess I can, I can do this. And boy, is it fun. Now, with this new breakthrough, I want to talk about it. It's called CRISPR-Cas9. What is it? 
It is a technology that comes out of a basic science project, which maybe we'll discuss, um, that allows scientists to make very precise changes to the DNA of cells. So at the level of a single base pair in the more than three billion base pairs of the human genome, for example. Is there some way you can describe it? Might be better if we had a pad and scash it out, but describe it for me. What is it? Well, it's a protein, so it's a very tiny molecule. Um, and it's a protein that is programmable, very much like you would program your, your computer to do something. This protein can be programmed to find a particular sequence in the DNA of a cell and make a very precise cut. So DNA is a double helical molecule, and this protein sifts through all of the DNA in the cell, many uh, millions and billions of base pairs, finds a particular set of letters in the DNA code, grabs onto it, and then uses a uh, molecular blade in the protein to cut the DNA. Not unlike if you were splicing film. Very similar. I think this is the thing about science that I find so fascinating, is that it's a, you know, it's a process, and it's a process of discovery. Um, I've always been interested in the fundamentals of biology, just understanding how cells operate in their environment. And in the course of research that I, my lab and collaborators were doing on a bacterial immune system, we recognized that the way bacteria fight the flu could be harnessed for a different purpose, namely for changing the DNA sequences in cells. And that's not something that I don't think I would have ever come to that without the path that we took through the basic discovery of, of bacterial immunity. And why should we be excited about this? We are excited about it, but why should we be excited about it? You know, we're in a, an exciting moment in biology, I would say. I think this technology comes along at a time when we have access to a number of other technologies that allow scientists to read the genetic code in cells. I think what's happened over the last few decades is that uh, there's been a growing appreciation of the nature of the code of life. That really started in the, the early 1950s when Francis Crick and, and James Watson and uh, other people, of course, were involved in discovering the structure of DNA. After that, there were then a series of technologies that came about um, Interestingly enough, many of them derived from uh, behaviors of bacteria mm -hmm. that allowed scientists to manipulate DNA in very precise ways. And some of these include being able to cut DNA, being able to copy DNA, um, being able to um, clone DNA, mm -hmm. make, make uh, organisms that would make many copies of, of particular segments of DNA. So these, these things happened in the 1970s and the 1980s and really brought about what was called the kind of the molecular biology revolution. Uh, people have, may have read about the, uh, you know, the $1,000 uh, human genome. So we went from human genome sequencing, costing you know, millions and millions of dollars to costing now today about uh, you know, just, just over $1,000. And so you know, these technologies all kind of laid the groundwork for the kind of thing that we talk about when we think about precision medicine. There's much discussion about this right now in our government and around the world is could we really develop ways to understand ourselves uh, and our, our DNA well enough that we could define and design very effective personal therapeutics for each patient. Rather than taking a generic drug for something, you'd have something that was actually targeted to, to you and to your affliction based on your uh, DNA. And I think to make that possible, it's really going to require the ability to manipulate DNA, to rewrite DNA. And this is where the CRISPR technology comes in. It provides uh, scientists with a simple, fairly simple way to, to do this very accurately, uh, very effectively in many different types of cells. And therefore, much and, faster. And therefore, much faster, much, much less expensively. And, um, in a way that allows many uh, scientists to adapt this for their own particular experimental research. So I think that's the moment that we're at, is watching that um, opportunity for many scientists unfold as they apply this to lots of different questions. But there is a sense of history in this, is there not? It's exciting. I mean, I think it's, you know, I, I think it's fascinating to kind of look back at how, how did we get to the point that we're at now in science, you know, and with this technology in particular, and it's a, 
it's a fascinating thing because it's not a it's not a straight line, right? It's you know it's a kind of a meandering line. And I think that's that's true for uh, a lot of science. You know, is that we we uh, set out to do something, and it's really through serendipity and observation and kind of the unexpected nature of research that we come across discoveries that lead us to the next step. And so it's not a it's not a linear path at all, and that's certainly true with CRISPR. What's new here is this ability to cut out something that's bad, splice it back yeah. together. Yeah. That's what you're talking about. That's what we're talking about, yeah. Let's go through the landmarks on your journey. You're teaching full-time faculty, doing your research. How did this lead to the discovery of CRISPR? I uh, was originally on the faculty at Yale, and I was recruited to University of California, Berkeley in 2002. And when I made that move, I decided that I really wanted my research program to become more I guess grounded in biology, you could say. You know, I really wanted to start studying cells and how they function, and so I was uh, interested in initially in that sort of w line of thinking about how to understand the way that that plant and animal cells use small bits of RNA for uh, protection against viruses. RNA stands for stands for ribonucleic acid, chemical cousin of DNA. People think that maybe this was one of the primordial molecules that led to the evolution of life. And so we were studying this process, which is called RNA interference, and trying to figure out the molecules involved and how it works. And then I, you know, I was sitting in my office one day at Berkeley, and uh, my phone rang, and it was uh, Jillian Banfield, a colleague of mine here at Berkeley, who I didn't really know. And she called me and she said, you know, um, uh, we are working on bacteria and the viruses that infect bacteria. And she said, my lab doesn't do any, we don't do any experimental research. We, all of the research we do is DNA sequencing. And that work has led us to a very curious finding, which is that lots of bacteria have a repetitive sequence in the genome, in the DNA, that includes little bits of viral DNA. And I think this might be a bacterial immune system, but there's no evidence for it yet. And she said, I also think that this immune system might be operating through an RNA intermediate. In other words, that the genetic information stored from viruses might be copied into RNA and then somehow used to protect the genome from future infection. So she said, I Googled who at Berkeley works on RNA, and your name popped up. So could we get together? And I would love to show you my data. And that's what happened. So we got together. We met at the Free Speech Movement Cafe, which is a uh, historically important cafe here on our campus. Cold, blustery day here in Berkeley. And you know, Jillian was uh, showing me her data. And I was just uh, blown away. It was uh, fascinating. And it seemed incredibly interesting that bacteria might have evolved a way to adapt to viruses and then use little pieces of RNA to find those viral sequences and destroy them. And that's really what got us started on CRISPR. So it was my, you know, if you trace it back, it was sort of my uh, training in graduate school that got me interested in the function of RNA molecules that eventually led us to CRISPRs. And what about the walk in San Juan? Where did that fit in? Yes, well, the walk in San Juan was later. So, you know, we started working on these, uh, these CRISPR pathways, and I had a wonderful uh, postdoc, uh, Blake Wiedenheft, who had come to the lab to work on this, and uh, was joined by a student, Rachel Harwitz. It was really their work that led me to uh, be invited to a meeting in San Juan, Puerto Rico, in 2011, where I met Emmanuelle Charpentier. And uh, she was working on a different type of CRISPR system from a bacterial pa uh, pathogen, which means a bacterium that infects humans. It causes the flesh-eating disease, if you've heard of that. And so her work had showed that this bacterium has a different kind of CRISPR system in which there was a single gene, a single uh, encoded protein that seemed to be sufficient to protect the cells from viruses. And we thought, we, in our, on our uh, walk uh, one afternoon in lovely old San Juan, Puerto Rico on the cobblestone streets there, we talked about this, uh, this uh, observation that people had made and we said, it would be very interesting to figure out the function of that gene, and uh, we decided to collaborate to figure that out. And so that was really what got my lab uh, launched in the direction of studying this protein called Cas9, which is part of the CRISPR pathway, but is 
unique in the sense that it's a, a single uh, protein that can be programmed to find and cut different DNA sequences. And it was really that work that led to the technology. Did you have a eureka moment? Was there a moment when you said, wow, this is big, this is really big? For me, I think it was really, there were sort of a few of those moments in a way. You know, it was really more of a, uh, a process. And, uh, you know, it was really through looking at the data that these, uh, these scientists in our lab were generating that we recognized that this was a very powerful way to recognize and cut DNA. And it was that understanding, that sort of fundamental knowledge of these molecules, frankly, that uh, you know, sort of led us to the realization that these uh, molecules could be harnessed as a technology. So I sort of take some delight in that because I, you know, I've always, uh, I've always enjoyed, uh, you know, just doing fundamental research, and I love understanding the molecules of life and how they operate in cells. And here was an, a case where that basic curiosity led to a, a point in time when one could say, here's a system that nature has created, but we can actually harness it and adapt it as a technology. Well, again, I want to move on, but before moving on, I want to say you know, any number of scientists I've talked to have said something along these lines. We need basic research because we do not know where great breakthroughs, will, where they come from. Right. In many ways, doesn't the discovery of CRISPR fit into that category? Oh, absolutely, no, no doubt. You know, I think um, for myself and my collaborators on this project, uh, we were driven by our curiosity about a bacterial immune system. We were not at all thinking about uh, technologies or, or genome editing when we started this work. So, you know, I think it just is a is a real uh, great example, actually, of how discoveries come from all sorts of directions that you can't predict. To those who would say to you, Doctor, I admire that, that's good, but we need science directed at specific problems. This business of knowledge for knowledge's sake is, that's nice for a few academics, but we need to turn more to this applied science. You say what? I say we need both, and, and I say we need more opportunities to help people that are doing uh, either very applied research or more fundamental research to get together, talk to each other, and recognize where they can uh, collaborate. Let's go back to the CRISPR breakthrough, scientific breakthrough that you made. With CRISPR, has it been overhyped? Certainly there are some um, media spins on it that I think are, are probably overhyped. You know, some of the uh, headlines about editing human babies, for example. And, you know, and I think scientists are partly to blame for this, frankly. I think, you know, not enough of us do come out of our laboratories to talk about what it is we're doing, take the time to explain what we're doing and try to, and it's hard, and, you know, and I'm certainly on a trajectory with this myself, but to try to be able to um, articulate what it is and why it is that we do what we do and how it affects or, or benefits society. What do you think is the adequate response to the hype about the promise of CRISPR? Well, I think it's, uh, I think it's to say, look, I, this is clearly a powerful technology. It's clearly uh, very exciting for, for many people. And uh, it clearly, I think, puts in front of us now opportunities that we didn't have even a few years ago, you know, for curing disease, uh, for studying the basics of biology, and for uh, um, taking agriculture in, in, and synthetic biology in new directions. So that's, that's for sure. Um, I think that it's important for uh, people to appreciate that in science, you know, uh, technology, even a, even a, a great you know, sort of powerful technology, um, takes time to turn into uh, therapeutic applications. They, they have to be, these, you know, therapeutics have to be vetted, they have to be safe, they have to be effective. And, you know, like or not, there's just that, that, takes, that takes time, usually many years of time. So I think that's what we'll see here. I think what's astounding to me personally is just the speed at which this technology has been adopted for you know a wide variety of applications. And and uh, you know if you think about it, you know the 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 work that I did with Emmanuel Charpentier uh, describing this and presenting it as a technology um, was published just under four years ago, 
and you know now we're where we are today. So I think you know this has really been um, a moment in which you know a technology came along. It's a technology that came along at the right time. It was an opportune moment when people were ready to be able to rewrite DNA. We had all of the other pieces in place. We really needed just this tool. And so when it arrived, it was widely adopted very quickly for all sorts of applications. And it's really pushing the pace of science forward in a, in a really remarkable way. Give me one or two examples of the application of this breakthrough science that you, among others, have brought to us. There's a well-known disorder called sickle cell anemia that mm -hmm. uh, many people are afflicted with. It causes a defect in the structure of a protein inside of red blood cells that causes the cells to sickle. They literally change their shape and they can't fit through blood vessels very efficiently. And there's no, unfortunately, no uh, way to, to really, cure, certainly no way to cure this disease right now. It's treated but not in ways that are very effective. So what if you could actually um, make a change to the DNA in the cells of patients that have this affliction that would actually correct that mutation and cause the cells now to make a normal form of hemoglobin in the blood? I think it's, a, it's sort of a, a moment in which we can envision a change to the way we do human therapeutics. You know, we can think about real cures for some diseases rather than trying to treat them chronically. I think this is now what's possible given this CRISPR technology. Now are we talking about a cure in some very distant future as for example frequently said we, we're on the verge of finding a cure for cancer or is this something that's real and can be applied fairly soon? You know the field is moving very fast right now. I think what's interesting is to um, look at the progress that many laboratories are already making using this technology in animal models of disease. So if we can do this in animals we can already see a, in principle a path towards doing this in human patients. I think we'll see clinical trials within a couple of years certainly for um, blood diseases for example where it's easier to deliver the editing molecules to the cells. I think one of the real bottlenecks in this field is delivery. How do we deliver these editing molecules into cells or tissues where they are needed? As anybody who reads the papers or watches television knows, there's a controversy about you know, genetically altering yeah. food plants. Right. Now, is CRISPR in that category or in a category by itself? Well, there's the, uh, there's the scientific answer to that question, and then there's the regulator's answer to that question. Um, <laughs> Scientifically, I would say that you know, human beings have been altering plants genetically for you know, millennia, basically as long as we've been uh, doing agriculture. So um, in that regard, you know, having a, one more tool in the toolbox to make ch genetic changes to plants, I think is, uh, you know, to me, is, uh, you know, it's a great thing and it will allow scientists to do fundamental research as well as, frankly, to help uh, create food, pro uh, food from plants that um, would provide additional nutrition or allow plants to survive in environments where they would otherwise be decimated. From the regulatory perspective, you know, in, in, here in the United States, um, there was a recent uh, ruling by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the USDA, that the plants that have been uh, where their DNA has been altered without introducing any foreign DNA into the cell by whatever method, including CRISPR, would not be, would not be considered genetically modified. You, you are modifying, but you're not adding or subtracting. Exactly, yeah. And therefore, this argument over genetically modified food sources right. enters a whole new phase yeah. with the discovery of CRISPR. Yeah, it does. Yeah, I think it pushes all of us to really understand what does it mean to genetically modify something and w by what criteria do we consider something to be genetically altered? Well, uh, this takes us to some of the ethical questions. When you talk about splicing microbes, when you talk about altering what's inside of us, it's not far from that to dealing with the very core creation of humanity. Yeah. Where do you see the red ethical lines and where, we, where are we with that? For me, um, one of the applications of this that I think raises concerns is the application in human embryos or human sperm or eggs. In other words, uh, changes to DNA that could be um, inherited by future generations. That 
is, if you think about it, pretty profound. It means really altering human evolution. Society really needs to be educated about this and thoughtful about whether and how to proceed with that kind of application. It could be that uh, for certain kinds of terrible diseases, um, the decision might be that uh, for those kinds of things, we should apply it to remove a mutation from, you know, permanently from the, the, the human race. Um, but where do we, where do we, how far do we go with that? I don't know the answer, you know, but I, I have felt very strongly over the last couple of years that the pace at which the research was moving was really uh, vastly outstripping uh, the uh, societal appreciation for the power of this technology. And I came to a moment more than a year ago now when I realized that the science was drastically outpacing the public's understanding of it. And, and you know, and this technology, you know, being very powerful and opening many doors for researchers, many scientists very excited about the opportunities. And yet I would, so I was interacting in that world during the day, and then I would come home in the evening and go to my son's PTA meetings and things like that, and I'd be interacting with lots of very smart people, but who had no idea about this. And I just, it seemed like an incredible disconnect. And, and I felt uncomfortable being involved in this and not uh, getting out in front of the conversation. So I've been very involved in um, spurring a public conversation about this, uh, trying to have chats like this to discuss this uh, technology in ways that people can hopefully understand so they can think about it and be aware of it and uh, that our uh, regulators can appreciate whether you know, and evaluate really whether we need to revise regulatory practices to take uh, into account the kinds of things that are now possible. The ethical waters get dark and deep here pretty quickly. For example, you, with those who work with you, make this breakthrough request boom. The information spreads worldwide. If somebody says, listen, what color eyes do you want on, on your next child? Or do you want your child to be tall? Or what height do you want? I mean, the potential is there to do that, isn't there? Well, I want to be very clear that, that um, in many cases, that kind of um, alteration to the human genome is actually not possible now, not because we don't have the technology to do it, but because we don't know which genes to change. Many traits in, in us as humans are multigenic, meaning there are multiple um, parts of the DNA that contribute to those properties. Even now in 2016, we, under, we don't understand very much uh, yet about the way that genes function in cells and interact. I think today we're somewhat protected from what you just described based on our own ignorance about our genome. But that will change over time, you know, it will. And, and I think that having a technology that enables that kind of precise modification of DNA really does force us to grapple with these, you know, challenging ethical questions of when and how and, and, and where and who should, should apply this. We can't undiscover it, of course. We have to, we have to grapple with that knowledge now and, and, and find ways to use it responsibly. What an important point it seems to me, that once something is discovered, it can't be undiscovered. No. Well, I guess one question is, it seems inevitable to me, a layperson, that while you can't do this at the moment, guarantee blue eyes if you want them, or a six foot five person if you want it. You don't doubt that that day is coming. Question, if we could do this, should we? I think there may be uh, uses of it to correct, um, you know, mutations that would otherwise cause terrible disease. And, and where, you know, frankly, we may get to a point where we say it would be unethical not to use it. But for other purposes that are more a preference or a choice of parents, I find that I, that's harder for me to think uh, would be right because I, I think one of the things that's so wonderful about us as human beings is how different we all are and how we come into the world with our own uh, points of view on things and you know having a child myself I've seen that you know he's got his own, he's got his own personality and his own interests and I don't think it has anything to do with uh, how I'm raising him it's just it's who he is it's probably in his DNA. And, um, you know, I, I, it's a blessing, and it's wonderful, and I would not want to change it, so. Well, I do know, saying on the, all about the ethics, that you played a big part in this meeting in Washington, D.C., fairly recently, uh, the National Academies of Science, to discuss the limits 
on this kind of, for some people, frightening future that this kind of knowledge leads us to, uh, how did that come out? I mean, for example, I'm, I'm thinking when the atomic bomb was invented, maybe not a very good connection, but there were questions then, well, where does this lead? Should, should we even invent this thing? Because if we do, who knows where it's going to lead? Yeah. Now, the world did come up with some what you call regulatory processes, but not everybody of it. So what was this discussed at this Washington meeting, and how did you come out on that? So it was a, a great opportunity to you know, sort of start discussing what I think is a very complex and fascinating topic and a little bit scary. And the end uh, point of that meeting was really the release of a, I would call it a consensus statement arising from that uh, discussion at that meeting in which uh, you know, I think we really um, made it clear that at least today that group does not feel it would be appropriate to proceed to use the CRISPR or any genome editing technology in the clinic, m meaning to create a modified person partly because we don't know enough yet about how the technology operates in those kinds of cells, but also because we haven't had time as a society to grapple with this issue. It's a, it's a big one. Now, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't ask you about the dispute. Uh, this is not unusual when someone makes, you've, you've made a breakthrough, you give credit to others who help with the breakthrough, but there's, I think dispute is probably the best word. Tell me what the dispute is, where it stands, and why anybody should care about it. Whenever there's a new technology that uh, comes along and there's opportunities to commercialize it, people would like to, to, like to make, lay claim to it. And that's certainly true with CRISPR. And the, you know, so the big sort of public uh, dispute at the moment that I think you're referring to is a, a dispute over patent rights to the CRISPR technology exactly. that's being played out between uh, the MIT uh, Broad Institute organizations on one side and the University of California on the other side. Now one thing to appreciate uh, is that uh, all of us as, as academic scientists, when we go to work at one of our organizations, we sign over the rights to anything we invent to our, to our institutions. So this patent dispute is really being played out at the level of the institutions rather than the individual scientists. Now, for the layperson, yeah. there's a tendency to say, okay, these academics see they have the chance to make money and they're fighting over a patent. But it goes a little deeper than that, doesn't it? Even though you and your group, Al Berkeley and those associated with this, put in for a patent on the regular track, if you will. That's correct, yeah. And the others, the East Coast contingent, went fast track. So they got a patent issue. Your side, the West Coast side, so I can say, wait a minute, we want to review this, we want to appeal this. While that appeal is being considered, they've already issued this fast track patent and companies are springing off of that and making money off of it. They are. Companies are not uh, waiting to figure out who ultimately will own the patents to this. They are forging ahead with the research they want to do. And I think more than a billion dollars have been invested now in, in CRISPR startup companies. I think this is commonly what happens in biotechnology, right, is that you know, this, this has been the case with other technologies as well, where there are disputes that take years to sort out, but meanwhile, the science forges ahead. And I frankly, I think that's, that's exciting. I mean, as a scientist, you know, I want to see this used to help people, to solve real problems. And I would hate to see the science uh, slowed down by this dispute that's uh, you know, being, uh, occurring in the legal system. You know, I come from the world of television, where jealousy, envy, personal competition is virtually Never unknown. Never happens, right? <laughs> virtually unknown. But this sounds to me like in your world of science, how do you feel about becoming a celebrity? Because like it or not, that's what you've become. It's a little bit of a strange feeling to be uh, in the public spotlight. I, not something I ever anticipated in my career, I have to say. You know, a lot of the press points out that you're not only a, a world-renowned scientist, but lo and behold, you're a woman, which in a way is unfair because if you're a man, they might not say that. On the other hand, this is the way of the world. You're, uh, I, I wouldn't say a rarity, but someone unusual for a woman to have to reach these heights in the world of science. Let's talk about that, can we? 
sad that you have to say that, but, but, uh, but yes. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about it. It's something very uh, important, I think, you know, it's, uh, is the whole issue of equity in science and gender equity in particular. How do we encourage more people to get engaged in the scientific enterprise? And, and you know, and girls in particular, you know, making sure they don't get turned off early on. I think that is often what can happen and then don't pursue careers in this field which uh, could really benefit from their insights. Well, I know that there, there are many young women in, in the audience who look up to you. Anything you can say to them to encourage them, perhaps even inspire them? I feel like I came from a very humble uh, background for one thing. I, you know, my parents, nobody in my family was a scientist. Um, I went to uh, not particularly distinguished uh, public schools all the way through uh, until I got to college. and. Um, you know, I just, I really just always uh, pursued what I found interesting. You know, there's, I, I see now in my own students and my own, uh, you know, members of my own family, just, you know, um, fears about, about uh, doing something, you know, fears about making a, a career, a particular career choice. And I, I think I've seen this in myself, you know, at times when I was uh, feeling afraid to take the next step or try an experiment or join a laboratory to do something because what if it doesn't work or what if what if I look silly or you know and I think one has to manage though you can't really dismiss those fears necessarily but I think managing them is important and I think that maybe for girls in particular finding ways to give them support at key points in their decision making process as they're getting you know early uh, education and training will be very helpful for encouraging them to you know, try things that are, um, you know, non-traditional maybe for women. What do you think is the key to getting more young people interested in the kind of world-class mathematics and science that have been your life? I think it's really important to show them that science is not about memorizing facts. I think that somehow sometimes gets uh, is miscommunicated in, in coursework that, that students are taking. I think, was, for me, science is about discovery. It's really about figuring out what we don't know and how do we answer those questions. Dr. I want to thank you very, very much. It was You've a been great so pleasure. patient with me and very generous for your time. I really I enjoyed it. I appreciate you greatly. It's a great really conversation. Fun.